Ladies and gentlemen, what we all been waiting for gives his heart, his soul, his passion, came up here to speak to everyone because of who we are and why we're here. Americans born to be free. Ladies and gentlemen, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Thank you, Gerald. Thank you, Father Kevin. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming here on this beautiful day in this beautiful historic spot. We'll take you back a couple hundred years when we were colonists, run by a king and a parliament 3,000 miles away. The king was looking for ingenious ways to raise money. One of those ways was to have Parliament enact the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act required that every piece of paper, every book, every financial document, every legal document, even a pamphlet you were going to nail to a tree, have the King's stamp on it. You went to a British government office and purchased the King's stamp. Question, how did the government 3,000 miles away know if you had a stamp on every piece of paper in your house. Answer, the Writs of Assistance Act. The Writs of Assistance Act permitted a, see if this sounds familiar, a secret court in London to issue a general warrant to British agents in America. A general warrant allows the bearer to seek wherever he wishes to go and seize whatever he finds. So it would be not uncommon for you to hear a knock on the door and a very polite British agent would say, we are here to look at your papers and see if you have the king's stamp and here's the warrant for them. Of course, they might look for more things. They might look for furniture on which you couldn't prove you paid the tax. They might look for alcohol that they want. They might even try and take over your house, which is why we have the Third Amendment 25 years later, prohibiting the quartering of soldiers against the owners of the house. The Stamp Act was so unpopular that Parliament rescinded it. And one of the reasons Parliament rescinded it is because some bright young students at then called the College of New Jersey, now known as Princeton University, did some math and they concluded that it cost more to enforce this tax than was collected in revenue. Now King George III was an idiot, but what would be the purpose of a tax that cost more to enforce than was collected, unless the purpose was not to collect money. The purpose was to remind the colonists that the king was still the king and he could enter their homes against their will for any pretended purpose he wanted. This was the last straw. This is what turned the tides of men and women's minds towards revolution. It was 10 years later, the day we celebrate today, when the Declaration of Independence was promulgated, and as Father Kevin just read, the most significant part, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Where do those rights come from? We fought a revolution. We won the revolution. By the way, in 1776, when we fought the revolution, According to Professor Bernard Balin at Harvard, who's still going strong at 96 years old and is a friend of mine, only one-third of the colonists were in favor of a bloody revolution. One-third would rather stay in the king's good hands. And, it's almost inconceivable, one-third didn't care. But it took the one-third to whip the winds of change and to fan the flames of revolution. It only takes a determined minority to preserve the liberty of the rest of us. We fought a revolution, we won the revolution, we wrote a constitution. When they met in Philadelphia to write the constitution, the first thing they talked about, as Father Kevin talked about, where do our rights come from? 
There was a big government crowd in Philly, represented by Alexander Hamilton and his buddies, and they argued that our rights come from the government, and the government can open that spigot of liberty or close it as it sees fit. James Madison, Jefferson was in Paris, Madison was his acolyte in Philadelphia, argued that our rights come from our humanity. Our humanity comes from God. So when they wrote the Constitution, which never would have been ratified without the Bill of Rights, and two years later Madison wrote the Bill of Rights, he said, listen to this, you know this phrase, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. I often ask law students, what's the most important word there? I'll say it for you again. Congress shall make no law, it's a trick question. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. The most important word is the, the freedom of speech, because it pre-existed the Congress. It pre-existed the Constitution. It pre-existed the Revolution. It pre-existed the Declaration, because it comes from within us. So all of these rights that are articulated in the Bill of Rights, I said to a couple of state troopers in New Jersey the other day, by the way, it's not a bill of safety, it's a bill of rights. You guys have to remember that. You guys also have to remember, you must have learned this the first day of the academy, it is unlawful for you to enforce an unlawful law and an unlawful order. But the rights don't say, con the, the Bill of Rights doesn't say Congress shall grant the freedom of speech, it says Congress shall not infringe upon the freedom of speech. So your right to think as you wish, to say what you think, to publish what you say, to assemble where you want, to associate with whomever you want, your right to keep and bear arms. By the way, that is not the right, that is not the right to shoot deer. That's the right to shoot tyrants when they take over the government. Your right to self-defense, your right to keep the government out of your house and that quintessential of American rights in the Fourth Amendment, your right to be left alone. All of these are articulated in our founding documents as natural rights. They come from our hearts. They come from our humanity. If you believe in a knowing, loving God who has counted the hairs on our heads. You can accept everything Father Kevin said. Even if you don't, even if for some reason you believe that human beings are the highest and best things existing on the planet, you can understand that our rights come from within us because we are rational, because we can use our rationality to enforce and seek happiness and liberty by the exercise of those rights. All right, the, the joy didn't last very long. Now, you remember, in those days, after George Washington's presidency, John Adams was president, and Thomas Jefferson was vice president, and they didn't speak to each other. Well, they didn't speak to each other. What are you talking about? Well, in those days, remember this, everybody ran for president. Whoever finished first became president. Whoever finished second became vice president. Imagine that today. Hillary, 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 will you attend this funeral for me in Uzbekistan? Maybe you'll stay there, Hillary. They obviously didn't get along. Adams represented the big government crowd. Jefferson represented the small government crowd. In 1796, there, 98, there spreads through the land something inconceivable today. Fear of the French. Fear of the French? Yeah, they had just cut the king's head off. So the people that were running the American government said, we don't want French people here. So we're going to enact the Alien and Sedition Acts, which say, if you want to come to the United States, come. We'll give you land. You can become a citizen. You can do it in six months, unless you're French. In which case, you have to wait 14 years before we'll let you, we'll consider you for citizenship. Oh, and by the way, whoever shall 
utter words critical of the president or the Congress or the government shall be guilty of a felony punishable by up to two years in a federal prison. So how can the same generation, in some cases the same human beings who had just written, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, have enacted this abominable piece of legislation that abridged the freedom of speech? The world obviously looks very different when you're on the outside looking in than on the inside looking out. One story about a famous prosecution for violating the Alien and Sedition Acts, and then we'll talk about what's happening today. There was a congressman from Vermont who was the Ron Paul of his era, who didn't care very much for President Adams or the Alien and Sedition Act. President Adams suffered from something that afflicts a lot of middle-aged men an ever-growing waistline. Mrs. Adams, in order to help him cover the waistline, gave him a purple robe to wear. She didn't like the way the purple looked just purple, so she sewed gold epaulets on the corners. And one day, Congressman Lyons approached the president and said, Good morning, your majesty. And the president said, well, you know, I'm not a king. You know, I'm not a king. I'm just wearing this because I have to wear it. Leave me alone. Next day, he showed up with the press in tail, and he said in tow, good morning, your pomposity. <laughs> and the president was very happy. The next morning, Congressman Lyons showed up and said, good morning, your rotundity. <laughs> and that did it. Everybody thought it was a joke, but he was indicted by a federal grand jury for violating the Alien and Sedition Act for mocking the president's waistline. He was convicted and sentenced to two years in a federal prison, which was the basement of an old dungeon in western Massachusetts. And while he was there, he did something that if you are from Chicago, Boston, Jersey City, or New Orleans, you're familiar with this. He ran for re-election from his jail cell, and he won. <laughs> And when he returned to Washington in triumph, expecting to mock the president's waistline, instead of the short, fat, big government John Adams, he found the tall, thin, raven-haired Thomas Jefferson in the White House. Jefferson proceeded to return the 480 acres of land that the government had seized from him because he dared to mock the president's waistline. One more historical story. It's the year 1812. The British are either trying to take back the colonies or we invaded Canada. We really don't know how the War of 1812 started. But the British burnt the capital, the burnt the White House. James and Dolly Madison barely escaped with the clothing on their back and they're marching through Upper Marlboro Madison. A troop of about 500 British soldiers takes over the town and they capture six militia and announced, unless the, the, the town surrenders, the militia will be hanged in the morning. Not to be undone, the militia, while the British had consumed a lot of soldiers, had consumed a lot of beer and were asleep, captured six British soldiers and said, you hang ours, we'll hang yours. The mayor, John Harris, decides on his own to walk into the British encampment at dawn, unaccompanied, unarmed, and said, peace, we'll return your six if you return our six. The British captain said, you have a deal. The British soldiers were returned. The town militia were returned. The British left the country. We won the War of 1812. Three months later, there's a tumultuous parade. The Mayor Harris is the Grand Marshal of the parade. Everybody's there. Federal judges are there. State judges are there. Prosecutors are there. Legislators are there. Farmers are there. I hope this doesn't, what happened to the mayor doesn't happen to me today. After finishing his talk, the mayor steps down from the podium and two strangers approach him. One of them puts shackles on his wrists and the other hands him a piece of paper. He was indicted by a federal grand jury in Washington, D.C. for treason, providing aid and comfort to the enemy in wartime by returning the British soldiers. Now there's a trial. 
There's no testimony at the trial. The prosecution says, look, Your Honor, we don't want to be here. The, the mayor's a hero, but he did aid the enemy in wartime. The defense stands up and says, everybody knows what the, what the mayor did. He was the impetus for getting the British the hell out of our, our county. The judge says to the jury, I never told this to a jury, gentlemen, there were no women on the jury, gentlemen of the jury, after you finish dinner and the innkeeper's best barrel of ale, I want you to deliberate on the following laws. The four person raises his hand and says, we don't have to deliberate, we already know the outcome. You don't have to deliberate? We don't. What is the outcome? Is the mayor guilty of treason or is he not guilty? He is not guilty. This is the first example of jury nullification in American history of saying to the federal government, get the hell out of here, just like we said to the British, get the hell out of here and leave us alone. I give you this history because it is not all good. It is not all inalienable rights and natural rights and the government will respect them. In fact, the government doesn't respect them. That's one of the reasons we're here. Today we have a government that thinks it can right any wrong and regulate any behavior and tax any event and transfer any wealth that it wants to. And today we have a government that thinks it can do that by executive mandate, not even by the, our elected representatives voting to make the laws. Today we have governors all over, the, all over the United States who think that because they issue something as an executive order, it somehow is a law. It is not. The same Constitution that guarantees Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech guarantees a Republican, lowercase r, form of government. And a Republican form of government means the legislature writes the law, the executive enforces only the laws the legislature has written, and the judicial branch interprets what those laws mean and if the executive branch has exceeded his authority. That, too, is guaranteed by the Constitution. But we don't have that today. Today, my dear friends, we have a government of fear. We have a government that says, hey, give me your liberty and I will keep you safe. And when we do that, we end up with neither, neither liberty nor safety. The government can't deliver the mail. It can't fill potholes. It can't stop robocalls. And we're going to repose our freedom into the hands of the government? Of course not. There was a time when I thought that maybe the state police are going to show up if I get a little too loud or a little too libertarian or a little too freedom comes from our hearts. And then I said to them, well, okay, you guys can show up, but the Fox News cameras will be here as well. Yeah! I don't have that uh, fear anymore. Because I know the only reason we have civil liberties in this country is because of small, passionate, fire-breathing crowds like this. Yeah! That that will not bow to the government. So the executive branch can't write a law and can't use the police to enforce them. We have a very draconian governor in New Jersey. Jerry asked me not to mention any proper names. I won't. Um, very, uh, very draconian. We have a very gifted attorney general who announced all those people that were arrested all those gym owners that were censured, all those people that got summonses, they're all invalidated. The governor didn't have the authority to issue any of them. I don't know how that will end up here, but it does rattle my bones when I hear these dictators threaten free people.
do as I say. Although in the case of New Jersey, it's do as I say, not as I do. I know state troopers that have seen him dining inside restaurants, which he himself has said can't offer meals inside restaurants, unless, of course, you're the governor. So why are we here today? We're here today because a great man in this town is the fountain of personal liberty in a free society, Gerald Salenti. Neither, neither, the, neither the rejection of friends nor the threat of foes will, determine, will, will deter the great Salenti from putting together patriots like those of you who are here today to celebrate the human freedom that we have that comes from within us. I expect that when I die, I will die in my bed, surrounded by the people who love me, faithful to our first principles. Not all of you will have that luxury. Some of you might have to die in a government prison. And some of you might have to die to the sound of a government trumpet blaring in a public square with people cheering your death. When the time comes, you will know what to do. You will know what to do because freedom lies in the human heart. But it must do more than just lie there. It must express itself and slay the tyrants. In the long history of the world, very few people have been granted the role of defending freedom in its maximum hour of danger. We are those people. You are that generation. This is your time. Thank you and God love you. A man of passion, a man of freedom, a man of heart, a man of soul, a man who is who he is. And his country is America. We are all Americans. This is Independence Day. We are born to be free. Thank you, Justin Palatano. Thank you all. We're going to have music. We're going to have fun. We're going to have a good time. And again, this is, I thank Neil Anderson, may his soul rest in peace, for making this possible. Please do what you can to donate to Occupy Peace, to make this keep moving, because my business is to be a visionary. I'll put my work up against anybody's. Yeah. Show me your books, show me your magazines, and we could talk. Yeah. I see the future. And this is not a future that I want to live in if we keep going in the same direction we're going now. They are robbing us of liberty, love, joy, and beauty. And if we don't stop it, we are going to live hell on earth. So please do what you can to unite for peace and again to restore freedom and restore freedom in this Occupy Peace and Restore Freedom came from Judge Napolitano. He said, I'll come here when I could talk about restoring freedom because we've lost it. And it's up to us to unite. It does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority. Keen on setting bus fires of freedom in the minds of men, Samuel Adams. And we are the men and women where that bus fire of freedom has been lit. So have a good time, listen to some more music, and occupy peace. Woo!